Shay Rushing. I am so excited to be bringing some more faith stories from the congregation for this Lent. And this year I'm going to be going out from the church and meeting people uh, in their homes and, and um, their churches and other places. So I'm excited to be here with Matt Rushing. Thanks for coming over. Thanks for taking the time. <laughs> uh, Matt, I know that you grew up uh, with uh, parents that were uh, music ministers, right? Well, my dad was. Right. Um, and mom uh, played the piano for the church choir. So I spent my infancy in a car seat underneath the piano on Wednesday, Wednesday nights most of the time. And actually, right after Carrie and I got married, after about 30 years or 35 years as a choir director, Dad had gone back to divinity school and got his first job as a senior pastor. So he changed changed gears um, later on later on in his life. And, yeah. Uh, hmm. So he's been a senior pastor ever since and was up in Lewisburg for a while. Now he's down in Holden Beach. So... But mom's still playing the piano every Sunday. So. <laughs> wow, that that's a real gift. Yeah, it is. She plays. I wish I played like her. She can just sit down. She plays whatever you put in front of her. It's amazing. So cool. it's great. Um, but it was, you know, an interesting an interesting part of growing up is focusing on. Um, you know, you you hear a lot more. You hear a lot about church business things mm. that you don't always hear about uh, mm -hmm. in other in other situations, but. Uh, all in all, we, mom and dad did a really good job of shielding my brother and I, and brother and sister and I, from all that stuff. So it was nice. And and the times are always appropriate, right? That's Correct. Good. That's exactly That's right. Well, I grew up. My parents. My mom always called us church groupies. So. Right. Uh, so we were we were the people that my mom didn't work at the church and neither did my dad, but they might as well have. At some point but they were always lives, there. Right? Yeah. That's exactly right. <laughs> So um, tell me about when you, um, I know that you changed careers, and I mm. want to know kind of like a little bit more about how that came about, how to make such kind of a big shift, and what kind of, how well, did it's God lead you through it, that? It's Carrie's fault, is what it is. As all things. Um, <laughs> I was, I, I spent a lot of time in training, software training and, and um, operations consulting, and in the 2008 economic decline, I got a call. Matthew had not yet turned one. It was right before Christmas, and I got a call uh, from the company I was working for that said, we can't make payroll, and we are letting go 25% of our workforce. That includes you, so as of right now, you don't have anything to do. I was working from home. They said, just stop what you're doing. Your benefits end in an hour, and... Um, sometime, oh my goodness! Yeah, sometime next week, just bring us back that computer whenever you're done. And I said okay, and that was a a horrible time. I, I, looking back on it, it was the greatest gift that ever happened. But then I had absolutely no idea what to do. Mm -hmm. Anna was um, Anna had just turned three that August. Matthew, like I said, had not turned one yet, and so um, Carrie sat down and said, "You're not really happy." why don't you just go figure out what you, what you want to do with your life? And I said, okay. So I went over to NC State. We were living in Raleigh or in Garner, and um, they have these great little things, silly little questions. Would you rather write a book or read a book, or would you rather watch a movie? Would you rather take a walk? Would you rather ride a bike? Silly mm -hmm. things. I did about five hours of that, and it came back, and it said that I should be in law enforcement or in medicine. <laughs> And, and you're not a cop. I'm not. And so I've got a very well-developed sense of not wanting to be shot at. Um, mm -hmm. And so I called the medical schools in the state and said, hey, this is the deal. I had a really good time in college. My grades weren't necessarily the best. I've been to grad school since then, did pretty well. Um, you know, should I even bother? And luckily enough, the dean of admissions at Brody answered the phone. Like the dean never answers the phone, but for some reason his name is Jim Peden. Dr. Peden answered the phone, and he said, "You know what?" He said, "We recognize you're not the same person you were when you graduated 12 years ago. Um, take your prereqs, take your admissions test, and if you do well on them, what happened before won't hurt you." And I said, "Okay." So then came the process. Now that I had permission to actually go forward. Then came the process of my 
hemming and hawing about whether or not if I do this, I'm going to have to leave the family. I'm going to have to abandon you with these two small children here. Mm -hmm. You know what to do? <laughs> and she finally said to me one night, <clears throat> she just interrupted me and she said, look, I got this. You're a better dad and a better husband if you're not miserable when you come home from work every day. If this is what you want to do, go do it. But if you're going to go do it, go do it all. Do it 100%. And that was really the point as the beginning of 2009 that I started the process. By that summer, I was enrolled in prereqs and trying to string together contracting jobs. I was kind of had my own company, so it wouldn't look like I had a gap in employment right. during all that time because nobody wants to see that. Um, and it was if you had if you had told me what was going to happen, I never would have done it because mm. it makes no sense that we should have gotten through it. Right, right. No sense right. in the oh, world. Yeah. Um, you know, I had to pay tuition as we went along. I wasn't working, but somehow it just always worked out. And and I remember the greatest, uh, you know, because my biggest thing was, what if we lose the house? What if we lose this? And Karen, she said, it's just a house. Who cares? Um, which I thought was, that was what I needed to hear mm -hmm. from that point. Um, one of the things that I really knew things were kind of working out on the right track was, I remember in December of 2009, <clears throat> it had been... A full year since I got laid off and actually I had gotten laid off again from another company um, which is a different story but um, yeah software training was not the gig that was not the thing mm, you wanted to be doing around yeah, that time but yeah. um, they, um, they were like we got it we know how to we know how to work this yeah you're not making us a whole lot of money so you're costing this <laughs> so you got to get out um, but yeah I remember in December of 09 our health insurance was due mm. And I remember the bill every month was three hundred and seventy-four dollars, and I rem and the choir at St. Andrews Presbyterian in Raleigh, they every year would pass an envelope for Carrie, just a little thank mm -hmm. you gift for her, and they just put it in a card. And so, so I remember that it was due like on a Tuesday, and we had choir rehearsal before Christmas on the Wednesday, and we they gave her a card and she said thank you, and then we got in the car, we got home, Carrie opened up the card and a few other things. And that three hundred seventy-four dollar bill was due in like in four days, and the choir had given us three hundred and seventy-seven dollars. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and I was like, okay, this is the way it's gonna be. <clears throat> um, so that's how it went. That's how it went. I finished all my prerequisites in December of two thousand and ten, so it took me a year and a half to get through all that. Um, and in January of eleven, I got basically a full-time contracting gig that lasted me until I went to medical school. And so it was just kind of like the whole, everything was just on pause. Mm -hmm. And the minute that I got done, it here's the job again. And it just lasted me until I got in. It was amazing. It was, it was fantastic. Yeah. So what, how, did you, can you name um, something, was there a sort of a spiritual shift for you when you went from, from, you know, working in, in jobs that, you know, maybe <clears throat> made sense, you know, financially or made sense you know, you know, you, that's how you end up in, in places that you don't expect. You sort right. of follow the steps, and sometimes you end up in a place you're like, oh, I didn't think I'd like this. And sometimes you're in there and you go, this is not for me. Yeah. Um, uh, I think the spiritual know. shift happened uh, through that process. Um, it was, okay, this shouldn't happen. These door, this, this series of doors shouldn't open. Um, and then they started opening. And mm -hmm. then... Um, at the end of it, which really happened, and it really didn't even happen when you get the letter that says well, you've gotten into medical school. It wasn't then. It happened well after that. But what it was, it was almost one of the things just like, you're being so silly, worrying about all these things, and I put you through the worst possible situation, mm -hmm. and look how you came out of the other side. Mm -hmm. um, I think Carrie will tell you, too, that year and a half, whenever you know, job prospects were bleak, if not non-existent at times, was actually probably the best time in our marriage. Mm -hmm. um, we, she actually said that to me as well, so you all can confirm <laughs> that. Carrie, Carrie would confirm that. <laughs> yeah, but we, we really, we'd been married, um, that in 08, we'd been married for six and a half years. And we really took that time and learned to rely on one another. It was really great for our for our marriage and our partnership. And as 
and has been since that since that point. You know, I think it really gave the two of us a, a beautiful foundation together that we just don't worry about a whole lot of other things about, you know, I used to get on Carrie all the time when we first got married because she'd have, we didn't have unlimited cell phone bills in contracts whenever we were dating. Oh, yeah. And she was in Florida and I was in Raleigh. And I remember our first Christmas married, somehow the people at Sprint Mobile found us in our apartment and because they gave Carrie the bill that she just didn't pay <laughs> in Florida because she just said, can't get blood from a turnip. And she didn't worry about it. And then, but the Sprint people worried about it. And mm -hmm. so, and then they found it and we took care of it and it was fine. But, you know, it, those sort of things never bothered her and they always bothered me. And mm -hmm. I think that we kind of had a way to, to just kind of come a little closer on both sides of the spectrum to make it better for us. But that's where the shift was. The shift was pay attention to the fact that you're getting to a place that's going to be better. And I didn't realize how much better. And I tell people all the time, you get medical school is hard, residency is hard, and it's long hours and all this other stuff. But I tell people all the time, my worst day in residency was better than a regular day before. Hmm. Um, and that lets me know that I'm where I'm supposed to be. And, I've, and I have embraced that, and I have loved that. And, you know, perspective is a great thing that's wasted on a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Unfortunately, and I, we were just talking to one of the medical students today, you know, experience is what you get when you don't get what you want. Mm, and yeah. I got a lot of experience there in a very short period of time, but it's been beneficial since yeah. then. So do you ever wonder, you know, you have this experience of kind of changing your whole life and taking this leap of faith. Do you ever wonder if God is preparing you for something else? All the time. <laughs> um, I, it, I, my family, we call it the curse because, you know, I mentioned my dad. Went, yeah, I caught that. Yeah, yeah he went, changed to, his, uh, went to divinity tag. school after I was in college. Um, you know, and he had, and I was the oldest of three. So he, there was, he had a brother, my brother and sister in school at the same time. He was in school. He got a master's of divinity and then a doctorate in divinity or a, a doctorate of ministry um, at Campbell. And he, you know, it was just not sort of the thing about, well, he never thought, well, I'm too old for this, and I'm too can't do this. It was just, I'm going to do something new. Um, mm -hmm. And that has, you know, it's the greatest gift in the world in some ways. You mm -hmm. know, in other ways, my roommate in college, I, we went to, we were in high school and youth group together. When we were in the ninth grade, he said, all I want to be is a, is a high school principal. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to be. When I grow up, I want to be a high school principal. And he's a high school principal. He's a principal of the high school Carrie and I went to uh, right now. Wow. And so... You know, he, I can envy that as well. Knowing what you want early and then following through and getting it and then just being open because I, who knows what I'm going to do. Carrie will tell you right now I'm not going back to school, but you don't know. You don't <laughs> never know say never. Um, she turned on me with a knife one day when I said, you know, maybe I might go to law school one day. She turned on she was cut, chopping vegetables. She said, you're done. You're, you're done with this. And I said, okay. But, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Um. And you got you just you you open yourself up, and all the experiences that you go through develop new passions, just like you said. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think uh, I got to go when I was a medical student. Got to go with Tom Myers to Zambia, mm -hmm. which really opened up a, a world of medical mission and mm -hmm. just humanitarian mission more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, which I think is important. I think it's important. You know, I would love to take Matthew and Anna to see these places. Mm -hmm. where the world is very different than the world that you know here in Greenville. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's it's important to recognize the difference in the world and how you fit into the world and what your contribution to the world needs to be. And so when you do that, you find a need. Right. And when you find a need, then you have to be ready, ready to move. You have to be ready to act on it. But some needs will stand out for you more than others. And, and those are the ones that I really feel, um, those are where your callings happen. Mm -hmm. I'm going to misquote Frederick Buechner, who said something to the effect of uh, where the world's deepest deepest need and your greatest gifts align is is your calling. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Um, if it brings you joy, you know, it'll be it'll bring others joy too. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, whether that ends up being medicine or music or anything else that is that we find important, or a marriage of all of it. 
which would be um, even more amazing, mm. then that, just wait and see. You wait and see what happens. And um, I think if you're if you're willing to look for it and willing to listen for it, I think it'll show itself up to you. And, and you just got to be ready to move when it happens. All right, so you get two more questions. Okay. So you brought up joy. What brings you joy? Um, different things on different levels. Um, music has always brought me joy. Um, music will always bring me joy. Carrying the kids bring me joy. Um, being a, a part of this community brings me joy. Mm -hmm. um, the just you know, I, I one of the one of the the greatest kind of quotes that I got from one of the the mentors in medical school. He was a pediatrician, and they asked him why is he a pediatrician. He said, "Well, I'm just basically a little old country farmer. You know, I just like to watch little things grow up." Mm. And that's kind of the deal, you know. I love I love these. There's there's kids now that are, um, you know, they're turning eight years old now. Are children that I delivered, mm. and so I'm watching these kids yeah, grow, that's neat. and I'm mm. and I'm watching, you know, and I'm watching them become brothers and sisters, and I'm taking care of their moms and dads and their grandparents, mm. and um, just to to know that these families are in these are in the communities, and you watch them struggle, and you watch them. You watch them grow, and you watch them die, and you watch them, you know, you just see mm -hmm. all that stuff. And that is, to be a part of that brings me a lot of joy. Um, and, you know, and it's, and really the unknown brings me joy. Mm -hmm. I love. I can see that. I love solving the puzzle behind every door that I don't know that's coming. Mm -hmm. Just the challenge of that every day brings me joy. Excellent segue to your last question, okay. which is what hope do you have for the church for facing some unknowns some discernment? Oh, yes, we are. Speak, speak, some, speak some words of life and hope for us. Well, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> words of life and hope. Well, you know, there's a parable that I read. I had to do a devotion uh, for an Advent, and I believe there was some passage from John about the fact that the, the gardener prunes the bushes mm -hmm. to grow the flowers, mm -hmm. and the pruning is important. You know, the, and we do the same thing for our children. You know, we, they get punished. They get, they, you know, you take them when they're brand new little, you know, four, two month old, four month old babies and they get shots and they look at you. They look to the parents and it happens all the time. You poke them and they look at their mom like, why are you allowing this to happen to me? This hurts really bad. I don't enjoy it. Please make this stop. <laughs> um, and, you know, but the pruning is often necessary. And so if you allow it and you just, uh, you just let, you let God's plan take root and everything is going to end up being better than you thought it could possibly be. Hmm. Um, the, every time, every time I've always tried to manipulate an outcome, it's never worked out. Hmm. But when you get to the point that you just give it up and say, I can't do this anymore. I don't care. Whatever's gonna happen is gonna happen. Then things fall into place. Right. And so, you know, we are going through some growing pains and some transitional pains and some uncertain pains. But you have to have faith that if you think of everything this church has been through, we haven't been abandoned yet. Right. You know, Amen. we're we don't deserve it either way. Mm -hmm. So what makes us think this is going to be anything different? We're going to be fine on the other side if we just take a breath, discern God's will for us as a whole, mm -hmm. um, and then and then let it move forward. Um, you know, we are the the the, diff, the challenge with that in a church though versus a versus an individual is. It's easy for me to just say, I don't care and let whatever happens to me happen to me. Right. It's very hard to say, I don't care and let what's going to happen to you or mm -hmm. to anyone else in the church, let it happen to them too. Mm -hmm. Let it happen to all of us together. Right. Because we're not going to be in the same level of apathy, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word, of, of, resign, of, of resign to the fact that we can't control it. Mm -hmm. That level changes with every single individual. Mm -hmm. So where some people are to the point maybe now where they're saying what's going to happen is going to happen and we're going to be fine, and other people are like we need to fix this to make this happen to let to get to this point. Mm -hmm. Those are all valid points and they're valid efforts. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but I do think that we'll, I think this will be fine. I think, you know, and just wait and see. Just wait and see. There's, it's amazing if, if you just don't try to force it. Mm. What's going to happen is going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, it is, the church has been around for a long time. Mm -hmm. Our church has been around for a long time, but the but church, the church as a whole, has been yeah. around for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't rush things and they find a way to figure themselves out mm -hmm. with a little bit of nourishment and a little bit of faith and a little bit of trust, then it works out. Can end up in a place that you might never imagine. And better than you could have, even if you could ever say, hoped. if we could, if the, the ideal situation, and this has been my experience, ideally, I would want A, B, and C to happen. Mm -hmm. And then I force it, force it, force it, doesn't happen, doesn't happen, doesn't happen. And then when you just let it go, so much better than ABC, mm -hmm. what that you could never have dreamed of, right? Would have happened. You know, it was my uncle uh, was a physician, and I remember I was in high school, senior in high school, and he asked me, "Do you ever think about going into medicine?" I was like, "Absolutely not, absolutely not. There's no way in the world I'm sacrificing my life for all these other people that I don't know that aren't going to appreciate it." No, and then, but I wasn't there. At 18 right. Right. or even 22 or even 30 mm -hmm. you know it wasn't until I really got to the point where I didn't know what else to do that this person who's beside me through everything just said why don't you just go figure out something that makes you happy right. and it's simple simple advice that completely changed the trajectory of all of our lives and so you know look for this simple message yeah. That's going to change the trajectory because it's going to be amazing what you think, what it'll do. Amen. Well, I'd like to ask you if you could close us in prayer and, you know, pray for our church and our community. Sure. We'd love to. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to share the stories of our faith, of the things that make us uh, so grateful for the gifts that you give and the love that you provide. We ask that you place a special arm around our church family as we discern what is going to be right for us. And we, we ask that we stay focused on your will and, and what's best for our church, your church, and the church in general. Be with us as we have often difficult conversations. Be with us as we Heal wounds, be with us as we move forward to new heights that we've not yet imagined. Um, we can't wait for that day to get here, Lord, and we're looking forward to seeing what you do with us all. Uh, keep us safe, watch over us, and bring us all together safely every chance we can do it. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen.